Greg, one of the great quests of humanity is to look to the future. And when some people think of the future, they think of next Thanksgiving. Other people think <laughs> of maybe my lifetime or my children's lifetime. But I want you to think with your two ways of thinking as a physicist and as a great science fiction writer of the far future. I'm not talking about a thousand years, but maybe a million years or a billion years or even into the cosmological future. What do you see with both eyes? Well, for us locally, uh, we're going to run out of living room very quickly, of course, but more to the point, the sun is going to keep getting hotter. We're going to have to either move or move the planet, for example, in order to keep it habitable. That's about a billion years. At, at that point, the planet will be so warm that it will be very difficult to sustain life as we know it. Of course, we can probably move the planet. Uh, we understand gravitation and, in fact, calculations have shown that you, by flying an asteroid by repeatedly, you can slowly tug the Earth out from the sun and keep it livable. You can tune your environment. Of course, we will have learned to tune the environment in many ways before that. Right now, we seem to be tuning it in the wrong direction. <laughs> yes, yes. But I think we're going to fix that fairly quickly. But it's fascinating what you say, that um, if, if the sun's going to get, as it gets hotter and the earth becomes inhabitable, we'd have two choices. We could try to move everybody or move the earth. People don't think you can move the earth. So how, how would we do that? How long might it take? Oh, it would be a continuous process because the sun slowly warms. Also, the evolution of the atmosphere proceeds in ways that we only poorly understood now, stand, that we understand now only poorly. Let me say that again. We now only poorly understand the evolution of the atmosphere, but it's surely going to evolve as the sun warms. So we will start, if we really do have this long-term vision, swinging asteroids by the Earth repeatedly in looping orbits and pulling it slowly away from the sun to maintain comfortable living. And that will become a standard engineering job. How big does the asteroid have to be, for example? Well, the bigger the better, but there's a trade-off. Yeah, sure. You get more of a tug <laughs> from a big one, but it's they're harder, harder to, to move. move. So something maybe 100 kilometers across. And how, how, what kind of engineering would be required to, to take that asteroid and move it into the, that finely tuned orbit? You'll use advanced rocketry, not chemical rockets, but probably something that accelerates m matter using electrical drives, uh -huh. for example. So you can run it off solar panels and you can use the rock that's already in the asteroid. You're slowly depleting the asteroid and using it as fuel. Yeah. So you keep doing this and you, and you slowly tug the Earth. The moon slowly follows because it's locked in on orbit. And then you can, you can make the planet fit the circumstance. Of course, other planets get warmer. So Mars, if you want some more room, you could presumably terraform over a scale of many thousands of years, and it will be warmer and easier to do that. It'll, you'll start to release water from the surface of Mars, and it helps you build an atmosphere. That's the main problem with Mars, no atmosphere to speak of. And therefore... Uh, there's no reason why you can't transform the entire solar system this way. Progressively. Right. But at, now there'll come a time, how many billion years into the future after that, between one and, say, five billion years, at some point the sun's going to change its sequence and move out of the main mm -hmm. sequence and start to expand dramatically and change its whole character. At that point, we're going to probably have to find another, another star mm -hmm. to... Uh, uh, to feed off of. <laughs> well, you can actually engineer the sun and you can buy yourself some time. All right, tell me how to do that. Well, stars leave the main sequence, start to swell up, and go bad, because they accumulate pollution at the core. The nuclear reactions there have products that make it harder and harder to run the reaction. And in fact, you start burning at hotter and hotter temperatures. That what that's what causes the star to expand. And 
we can solve that problem if we can find a way to stir those pollutants out into the rest of the star. The sun will go off the main sequence when it's burned only something like 10% of its material. It's got 90% left, but you can't get it into the core. So if we can find a way, probably electromagnetically, to induce large currents, we can literally stir the atmosphere, move the pollutants out, and we can make the sun last uh, instead of 5 billion more years, maybe something like 50 billion wow. more years. Wow. We're talking about prime real estate here. <laughs> so if you need to remodel... Yeah, I'm not so anxious <laughs> to move. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, this is enormous gargantuan engineering. But it's but, theoretically possible. Uh, I mean, it's, yes. it sounds like the engineering is, <laughs> is, is a huge feat, but there's no fundamental right. physics you have to discover. Right. That, that's a thing that's hard for people to grasp. But of course, we take for granted now feats of engineering that a thousand years ago were unimaginable, simply beyond belief. But the virtue of science is that it tells us roughly how to do it now. We're talking about engineering we will need to start in five billion years or so, or sooner if we want to really do some, <laughs> some nice refurbishing. Uh, and we can do it using the laws that we know now. Of course, it's huge engineering. But after all, as you know, as an economist, if you invest early and let the interest rates work <laughs> for you, you can afford to do the remodel. All right. I'm going to take you further for a little while. Let's say we do everything you said, and it's 50 billion years, but it's not forever. And 50 billion years in cosmic scale could be a pretty short time. So that's not too bad for us, but all right. In 50 billion years, now the sun is used up and we're fabulous technologies. What do you see as the future beyond that? Well, at 50 billion years, you really are running out of stars. The stars like ours are mostly going dim or dead. Most of the supernovas have happened. Uh, the small dwarf stars are still there, and you could go to the nearby small red stars and live there close to the star to stay warm. Uh, but, of course, that's the low-rent district, so to speak. Uh, we could spread out and use those. Uh, but inevitably, uh, yeah, the solar reactions are going to burn out. In a 100 billion years, it's going to be tough staying warm. Beyond that, you have to harness really bizarre forms of energy getting. You have to, say, drop objects in close to black holes, fragment them, throw some into the hole, some out. It comes out with higher energy. You harvest that energy. That's a method we already know of. It was uh, devised decades ago by Roger Penrose and others. So you can then use black holes as basically energy sources for a very, very, very long time. But of course, it's enormous scale engineering again. Uh, there really is no prospect for life to go back to the simple, small, tranquil paradise that we imagine we came from. Uh, you know, Thomas Hobbes' nature, red and tooth and claw, it wasn't all that good back there. Uh, then to move forward into larger and larger scale manipulation of our environment for two reasons. First, we're becoming a big influence, as we all know, on this environment. But second, the environment will change. Nothing's forever. And humanity or any intelligent life is going to have to adapt to a universe that evolves itself physically and requires intelligence to stay alive. 